The next one is related to prayer. And this may be dated. I don't think it's too dated, but uh, I'm reading a quote. I think it's a quote from you, which is, I'm trying to write a book on prayer for people who struggle with prayer. And I think most people do, at least the ones I know. And then it goes on to talk about other potential books on forgiveness and so on. I would love to know what prayer means to you and if such a book would be for religious people or if a version of prayer would be made available through such writing to people who do not consider themselves religious. Definitely the most personal question anyone's ever asked me, Hmm. Tim. But since we've been talking now for almost two hours, I feel like we're very close. (laughs) Now I'm teasing, of course, but let me try to answer that. I, I am trying to write a book on prayer. And since I became president of Shalem College. I was lucky to finish Wild Problems. I haven't made any progress on that prayer book since I got to Israel. It's kind of ironic, the Holy Land. But I think for people who aren't religious, and I, by the way, I was not religious my whole life. So I had a, a part of my life where I was not praying regularly and where I was not keeping the Jewish Sabbath and where I was eating lobster and pork and enjoying it immensely. And I think every, not everyone, it comes back a little bit to the comment I made earlier about being tone deaf, but most people, I think, can experience the transcendent or the a word that I find very difficult to think about, but I love the word. It's imminent, not meaning soon, but sort of embodied in you, imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. And in the book that, that I'm working on uh, someday, maybe, I talk about the handful of times when I've come into contact with that. And I'm sure you have too. The example I use is I'm in California. We've taking the family, my wife and I have taken the kids to see a, a Shakespeare production outside in uh, in Santa Cruz, which is just really fun. You're in these redwoods and uh, it's it just, it's lovely. And it's been a long day. We've had a good time as a family and we're driving back. And I think everybody's asleep in the car except me. We're driving back to Palo Alto. And um, I realize that to my left, It is such a dark night for some reason, and there's so little light pollution that the stars are as vivid as they are, say, in Yosemite or the Negev, the desert here in Israel. These are the two places I've seen the best stars in my life. And they're luminous. They're not just like white dots. They're, They're luminous, and you can see them all the way down to the ocean. Right, I'm on the coast, so I'm coming up, I'm driving north on the coast, and I can see constellations and stars out the horizon. Mm-hmm. I mean, it gives me goosebumps to talk about it. Yeah, I don't remember if I woke everybody up or if we even stopped the car. I, I just, it was a little bit dangerous. I'm, you know, I rolled down the window to get better sight. And I remember just, I kept turning my head and um, I felt connected to something. Now, was I really connected to something? Am I imagining it? I don't really care, actually. I hope it's true that there's something greater than just nature and the material and, and my um, animal self. But there might not be. But I do feel it sometimes. And I think most of us have moments like that. Alan Lightman, the physicist, has a wonderful book on this. He's an atheist. But he talks about lying in a boat, looking up at the stars and how you feel something. And it, it bothers him as a physicist. And he writes about this discomfort that he feels something transcendent there, something bigger than himself. So you can feel it out in nature. I have felt it many times, not enough, but many times in random encounters with human beings under duress. Uh, I'm sure you have too, where you you meet someone who's having a very bad time and you interact with them in a way that is not normal. You don't usually have people sharing incredibly personal things, but they do. They need to share it. And they pour out their heart to you and and you're there for them. And, you know, one of these moments for me is uh, this person said, you don't want to hear this, do you? And I said, no, I do. I do. And the truth is, I didn't want to hear it, but I did. I was compelled, literally compelled. I wasn't going to go anywhere. I wasn't going to, I mean, part of me wanted to run away because it was so painful. It was such a, a heartache this person was sharing. Somebody I didn't know very well. And those moments, those handful of times in in my life as a human being, where I've encountered another human being either under duress or in joy, it's also in joy. You know, the birth of my children shared where I was in 
you know, privileged to be in the in the room with my wife when we when she I was gonna say when we gave birth. She did most of the work, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> when she gave birth, those moments are not just like, oh, that was really fun. Even more trivial ones, you know, great great musical performances. You know, I've I've written about this. Um, you know, watching next to normal, and I think her name is Rachel Bay Jones, pour out herself in front of a two thousand strangers and expose herself emotionally as the character in that play and do it in a way that isn't just like I'm act she, you don't feel like she's acting at all. You feel like she's sharing a piece of her humanity, giving you access to something that's in you too. Those moments they're they're transcendent. They're part of something bigger than ourselves. So that's what I think of with prayer. I think of prayer as accessing those or trying to access those more frequently. And for me, it's tied in with a belief in God or a hope of God's being there and listening. But I think for non-religious people, there's something there even when it's not religious. It's spiritual, whatever you want to call it. 